Verse 26, And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah, my son, and he knew her gain no more. This is something that was repulsive even to Judah. But this is the way the Canaanites acted. <laughs> this is the way they lived. Don't you see that God's going to have to get his people out of that land and away from that? And may I just pause this moment to make this application because these things happen unto them, for examples unto us. Now, I hear a great deal today that if you're going to witness to this generation and if you can communicate to them, you've got to get down to their level. I disagree with that. God's never used that method to witness God's always, under any circumstances, ask his people to live on a very high and lofty plane. Now, I can well understand that somebody might have come along, one of these present-day theologians have come along and said to Noah, Now, listen, brother Noah, you are spending all your time working here on this boat, and you ought not to be doing that. We are having a big party over here in Babylon tonight, they uh, just got in a new shipment of marijuana, and we tonight are really going to blow our mind. We are all going to pass around the grass, and we're just going to have a high old time, and we're going to take a trip. And you don't need to build a boat to take a trip. We're going to give you a trip. Come on over. And Noah says, no, I'm not. Well, brother Noah, how you expect to reach all the hippies of Babylon? How are you going to reach the Babylonian beboppers unless you're willing to come down and communicate with them? fact of the matter is God never asked him to come down and communicate. God asked him to give his message. That's what we are asked to give today. And I'm firmly convinced that if God's people would stand firm, and especially these men today that are so afraid they'll lose the crowd, so afraid they'll not have an audience to speak to, and they do everything in the world to get a crowd to speak to, and some of them are having their problems. But God never asks us to compromise. God asks us to give the Word of God. I remember hearing years ago the story about Dr. Schofield over in North Carolina. He's invited over there to speak, and it was a rainy night, the first night he began, and there's a very small crowd there. And the pastor felt called upon to apologize to Dr. Schofield. He reached over and he said to him, I'm very sorry tonight. There's so few people here to hear a man like you. We just regret it very much. And Dr. Schofield, he said, well, my Lord only had 12 men to speak to. And since he only had 12 men and never complained, may I say, who is C.I. Schofield? He should complain about a small crowd anywhere. My friend, that's a lesson that this generation hasn't learned. We think it's got to be big, and there's got to be a lot of people there, or God's not in it. Maybe God has just called us to witness in these days. But I have news for you. I believe that if the Word of God's given out, it'll have its effect. It will certainly bring results. And Judah went down, and he sure communicated to the Canaanites. He couldn't have got down more on their level than he did. And look what it did. It brought tragedy. Now we're told, verse 27, it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. It came to pass when she travailed, and the one put out his hand. The midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first came to pass as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach is upon thee. Therefore his name was called Phares. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his head, and his name was called Zera. Now, here are these names that we've looked at. And I'd like for you now to go with me over to the first book, of the New Testament. And let's read here the first chapter, second verse. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zara 
of Tamar. And Thares begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and on down uh, Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. And if you just follow it right on through, why, you find out here, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who's called Christ. This is the line into which the Lord Jesus came, by the way. And this is an evidence of the fact that God must now get his people down into the land of Egypt. All right? We'll return then to the story of Joseph, because he's already down there. He didn't go down willingly, but he's down there. He was taken down, and we saw at the conclusion of chapter 37, the 36th verse, the Midianites sold him, that is, Joseph into Egypt under Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Now we're going to find out that Joseph is an altogether different kind of boy than Judah was. I always have felt that Joseph and Benjamin did a great deal of teaching and instruction and personal attention that the other ten boys never did get. These were the only two that Jacob seemed to be interested in. Now, Joseph, because of the hatred and animosity of his brothers, he's been sold down into the land of Egypt in the house of Potiphar, and he happens to be a very important soldier. He's in the military. He had his office in the Pentagon of that day, and he's part of the brass. He's a prominent official, by the way. We had an interlude last time in the 38th chapter, which we've classified as the worst chapter in the Bible. It tells a sordid story of Judah, and it seems about every one of the sons was a problem child, with the exception of Joseph and Benjamin. And, of course, Joseph and Benjamin both brought him great heartbreak when they were taken off to the land of Egypt. Now, we saw last time that we were looking at Joseph in the 37th chapter that he was sold down in the land of Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of his guard. Now, this is a pretty dreary prospect for a 17-year-old boy now way down in a foreign land sold into slavery. And there is certainly nothing in the outward aspect of things to bring any encouragement to his heart at all. And this boy seems to be more or less of a hard luck boy. You'll notice down in the land of Egypt, just as everything seems to be moving smoothly and nicely for him, then something always happens. But it happens for a purpose. And it was difficult for Joseph to see it. God never appeared to him at all. He's the one patriarch now that God did not appear to. And yet there's no person in the Old Testament in whose life the purpose of God is more clearly seen than in Joseph. The providence of God is manifest in every detail of this man's life. The hand of God was upon him, and the leading of the Lord is evident. But Joseph is the one to whom God did not appear directly. God appeared to Abraham, he appeared to Isaac and Jacob, but not to Joseph. And we see, though, the direction of God in his life more clearly than in any other. He's the Old Testament example of Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And Joseph himself expressed it in rather vivid language. When you get to the last chapter of Genesis, you'll find out when the brethren at the death of their father felt like Joseph might turn on them, they came to him to actually ask for mercy. And he told them he held no grudge against him. He says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. 